evening, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Welcome to this program of Hamurabi Tablet. Uh, let me brief you about this forum first. Hamurabi Tablet is a forum for budding lawyers and law students. Since last three and a half years, we have been conducting various programs for lawyers and law students. Uh, as a part of this activity, every third Saturday of the month, we conduct a lecture wherein we invite a guest who is a lawyer and expertise in a particular field of law. Till date, we have conducted lectures on various aspects of law and certain subjects which are related to the legal field and legal practice such as voice therapies for lawyers and uh, marketing, social media marketing for lawyers. Today, the topic is how to fight PI. We are having our guest who is an eminent lawyer in Bombay High Court. He is Advocate Manjuri Shah. I will give a brief introduction of our guest. Our guest is a solicitor and is a counsel practicing in the Bombay High Court since 1990. She has appeared in many matters as Amicus QA and the court has acknowledged and appreciated her legal activity. So without wasting time, let us in call our guest, Advocate Manjiri Shah and our founder, Advocate Rahul Master. Mr. Maskar, Mr. Kulkarni, organizers of Hammurabi Tablet Lecture Series, and ladies and gentlemen, may I say I'm delighted to be with you all today. It takes me back to the days when I used to teach at the law college. Of course, that's a long time back. And as the audience, as you all are, you are far more learned. You are all students, I believe, who yes, are uh, practicing lawyers and some who are here to know more about public interest litigation. This is a topic where I think mm -hmm. I will be learning with you instead of me giving a lecture. I think this is going to be a far more interactive session. With that, let me begin. What is a PIL? What is a pill? Is it a magic pill? Let me tell you about some magic that I witnessed some years ago. If you walk to Flora Fountain, and if we stand at Flora Fountain with her back to Churchgate Station, what is it that we see? What are the buildings that we see over there? At Flora Fountain. With her back to Churchgate Station, Right in front of us is this wonderfully refurbished Zara building. To the left will be the magnificent Oriental building. You have the building housing Kitab Khana, Mullah House, Frulain. Towards A little towards our back will be High Court. On this side will be the CTO. Today, this entire precinct, heritage precinct, is there unhindered for each of us to see. But about 35 years ago, when I first stepped onto Flora Fountain, the view was quite different. Not a brick of the building could be seen. Why? Because all the buildings were covered, every inch available of the, all the buildings in the heritage precinct, except of course the High Court building, all of it was covered by huge hoardings. The BMC was earning a very, very good revenue for permitting people to put up these hoardings. But they were an eyesore. A Dr. Anaita Pandol, who is a practicing gynecologist, went to the court saying that these 
hoardings, these huge billboards ought to be removed. This is a heritage precinct and we do not need these hoardings obstructing our view. It was a writ petition. In those days it was not called a PIL as it is categorized now by the High Court. The High Court after a struggle upheld the contentions of Dr. Pandol and ordered that within a period of four weeks all the hoardings should be removed from heritage pressings. Heritage pressing being fountain including the marine drive, all of it. The High Court held that these hoardings in a space starved city of Bombay where there are very few recreational places available to the citizens or to people who are visiting. These, the obstruction of by the hoardings is an obstruction to the vistas that are available to people. The High Court said the hoardings have to go. The city as we see it over here, Flora Fountain is literally the crown of Mumbai, the crown jewel of Mumbai. It is a little bit like London in terms of the Art Deco Gothic buildings. Now this came about only because Dr. Pandol, who was a public spirited citizen of our country, decided to take up the cause. This is public interest litigation. We have been beneficiaries without us knowing it of so many causes that groups, individuals have taken up. For example, the noise warriors. You have a Dr. Mahesh Bedekar, you have a Dr. Oak, you have uh, Avaz Foundation and Dr. Sumaira Abdul Ali. These are people who have relentlessly fought against noise, which in a country of ours where any festivity means noise. These voice no noise warriors have ensured that we get peaceful sleep. It is thanks to relentless petitions filed by these individuals and organizers, organizations that we have a 10 o'clock deadline today. There are only few days that the Supreme Court has permitted every year when this noise can con continue up to 12 o'clock. So we have been the beneficiaries of such public, public spirited citizens. So what exactly is PIL? There are PIL rules which have been framed in 2010 by the Bombay High Court. According to section 3E of the PIL rules, petitions which are filed pro bono publico that is for public good are categorized as PIL. The other, other category of petition which comes under the definition of public interest litigation under section 3A, 3E, rule 3E of the High Court rules are petitions which are filed for public law interest. Now what therefore is public law interest? is the next question that comes to us. The best way of ascertaining what is public law interest is to first figure out what is private law interest. What are private laws according to you? Anyone? Right. Contractual dispute. Next. Anyone? Consumer. Next. Personal laws, family laws, yes. Labor laws, tort law, right. So each of these rights, each of these disputes or laws that you all have mentioned, these are disputes, these are laws which regulate relationship between two private entities. They may be individuals, they may be companies, they may be partnerships, but these are essentially private. So. All of these regulations, disputes pertaining to these resolution, reg, uh, these laws are not, do not come under the category of public interest litigation. Now therefore, what when the rule says, rule 3E talks of public law interest, let us go to what is 
public law. Public law is any law which is between, which regulates relationship between the state, that is the country or the state where we live in or and the individual concerned. So, here both the people are not private, the individual or the organization may be private, but the other person is a statutory authority, a government, a government body, a government company, any of them. So, these laws would be public laws. Now, which would be the public laws? Constitutional laws, administrative laws, municipal laws, criminal laws. Right. So, each of these laws are public laws. So, therefore, public law interest petition would be that petition where there is a right available to a citizen or in certain cases non-citizen, right available which is not being upheld because of some action of the state or there is a duty that the state has, which duty is not being fulfilled by the state. And these are the situations where you can file a public interest litigation. Now, public interest litigation is contrary to a private interest litigation, it is an it is not an adversarial litigation, it is an inquisitorial lit litigation. Yes, it is the government who is arrayed as a party respondent in a petition, but it is not adverse to the government in that sense, in the sense of a private interest litigation. Because at the end of the day, both the state and the PIL petitioner want to uphold a law which is a human rights law, which is in public interest, some which way or the other. So, therefore, a public interest litigation is not a adversarial litigation, it is more a inquisitorial litigation. Now, under what provision of the constitution would a public interest litigation lie? I am sure you all know this answer, all of you all. Right. How many of you all are lawyers? All right. So, you all know this. Under 32, what rights can be agitated? Right. Only the fundamental rights can be agitated by the uh, in the Supreme Court by the party petitioner. A 226 uh, petition, a 226 Article 226 will give a far wider scope for the High Court because in this case you can file a petition for fundamental rights for the breach of a fundamental right or to uphold a fundamental right or it can be filed for any other reason, any other reason. So, therefore, it is a wider cause even if there is no breach of fundamental right but there is some other statutory right which is being breached, you can still go ahead and file a, pub, pub, a writ petition and PIL is a category of writ petition. Now, under 32 and 226, the Supreme Court and the High Court have the powers to pass required directions, orders or writs. Writs may be the five prerogative writs which is the habeas corpus, mandamus, certiorari, co warrant, or prohibition. It can be either of these five writs or it can be writs other than those writs. Because it is essentially an order, it is a mandate that the court issues and the court's mandate has to be followed. Now, what are the kind of reliefs that one would want under that one, are, one is entitled to under a 226? or a 32 PIL. You can ask for a declaratory relief declaring a particular law to be illegal or void. You can ask for an injunctive relief. Suppose there is a breach of a fundamental right which you think is going to take place, you can ask for an injunctive relief. Suppose there is 
a law, uh, suppose there is a right which has already been breached, then you can ask for some kind of compensatory relief. Let us take for example, the case of uh, Rudul Shah versus the state of Bihar. Uh, this would be uh, the case, uh, it was a 1980 uh, case I think, 1982 case. Now, in this case, a man was acquitted of a criminal charge, but he continued languishing in prison for 14 years thereafter the court awarded compensatory costs in the PIL filed for his re seeking his release. So, therefore, compensatory costs in certain cases can also be given by the court. Which are the two main articles in the constitution which any of us in a PIL would be looking at? The two magic mantras that the constitution has given the two main two main important fundamental rights 21 and 14 21 anyone who wants to talk about 21 right to life and personal liberty what would right to life include it's a very very wide scope that the supreme court has the supreme court and the high courts have uh, come up with what is the scope of article 21 and right to life. Mm -hmm. Give me examples. Right to clean environment. Right to clean environment then. Right to fresh air. Right to live with dignity. Good. You guys should be talking here. You all know it all. I don't know why I am talking. <laughs> you all are a wonderful audience. All right. Right to privacy. What else? Anything else? Prisoners right. Prisoners' rights always. So, ev right to life is something which has been very, very widely uh, interpreted, and all of us have benefited because of that right. How about 14? What is Article 14? <laughs> Now, is there a reasonable classification that can come about in a legislation, right? So, you can make a reasonable classification. I think there was a Karnataka High Court judgment where Sikhs were allowed not to wear helmets. So, that was a reasonable classification that the Karnataka legislation came up with. And that right was upheld by the Karnataka High Court. Now, we come to the most one of the most important topics in a PIL, the concept of locus standing. Is it only that a person who has the locus standi can that can file the petition or can somebody who does not have a locus file the petition? Let us understand what we mean when we say locus standi. The best example that I can give you is the judgment of Anirudh Kumar versus Municipal Corporation of Delhi, which has been reported in 2015, 7 SCC 779. Now, in this case, a pathological laboratory, a path lab was set up in what was an essentially a residential building in Hoskas in Delhi heavy medical equipments came in. There was a first floor and a mezzanine floor, which was being occupied by the uh, path lab. There were 25 air conditioners. There were two huge diesel generators. The path lab was doing rip roaring business. So, there was every day a lot of footfall, which caused immense traffic jams and parking problems over there. From 1995 for almost 25 years, several complaints were made against the path lab. But the path lab managed to get a registration certificate from the Delhi Municipal Corporation. 
the petitioner Anirudh Kumar was a gentleman who was living on the second floor of that building. He filed a PIL contending that this causes nuisance, this causes safety hazards. The High Court rejected his PIL. The High Court said that you live in that building and therefore yours is not a public interest. The Supreme Court did not agree with the High Court. The Supreme Court said that with so much of noise, with so much of load on the structure, with so much of testing being done in what is a residential area, it is the life of public at large in that area which is affected, it is a question of their safety and therefore the Supreme Court said that public interest litigation would lie rightly in the case of Anirudh Kumar and therefore the registration certificate was issued by the Delhi Municipal Corporation was held to be invalid. So now this is a case where the gentleman had a locus standi. He was affected, his rights were affected and therefore he was permitted to file a PIL and his PIL was upheld. But what about the cases where the petitioners do not suffer any injury personally, no legal injury is caused to them, but yet they choose to file public interest litigation on behalf of others. Now clearly there is no locus standi. Initially the courts were very wary of entertaining petitions by such petitioners who themselves did not suffer from any injury. The court was of the mind that these are busy bodies, they have got nothing to do with it and why should they be allowed to file a PIL. But soon the court came to the conclusion that a litigation is a tedious, time consuming, expensive procedure. And people are not going to file PIL just for the fun of it. It is only those who are really interested in a cause that who would come to court and file a PIL. So therefore, slowly and steadily, the concept of locus standi as we know it got watered down and the scope of a PIL increased hugely. The litigation and the judgments as we see and the constitutional law as has developed in India from 70s, 80s up to date. We can see the concept of locus standi and the kind of cases which have been entertained by the court in PIL falling into three distinct categories. The first were in the 70s and 80s where it was the downtrodden, the poor, the ones who did not have a voice. The, those were the people who were given a voice by PIL petitioners. So we have the celebrated Bandhua Mukti Morcha case where the bonded labourers were released. We have the Asiad case where contractors hired labourers to construct the Asiad state, uh, stadiums and the villages but they were not paying them, not treating them the way they should have been treated under the existing labour laws. So that was the case where PUDR, People's Union for Democratic Right was allowed to intervene and it was their letter which was taken up as a petition. We have the case of pensioners right, old pensioners right in DS Nakara case. Then in 90s, 80s and late, uh, early 90s came a spate of litigation, uh, PIL petitions for protection of environment, for river, we had MC Mehta who was the PIL warrior. Later in 90s, we've had PIL petitions 
which petitioners have filed for probity in public life, for against corruption, for governance with integrity and morality. These are the broad locus, these are the broad PILs which have been filed so far and the concept of locus standi has been uh, expanded from time to time by the court. But with this expanded locus standi concept, with a more liberal interpretation of locus standi by the uh, courts, also came in abuse of the PIL provisions. Courts showed their unhappiness by charging, uh, may, uh, by dismissing petitions, by making scathing com uh, comments, remarks, sometimes awarding compensation, uh, awarding costs against the petitioners. The watershed case, which led to the framing of PIL rules in every single high court, was the case of Balwan Singh Chawfal. Now, this is a very, very interesting case. Each of you all must go through this because it is in a nutshell a history of the entire PIL this far. The citation is 2010, 3 SCC 402. Now, Balwan Singh Chawfal, this judgment, the issue was a challenge by an advocate to the appointment of an advocate general in the state of Uttaranchal. The gentleman who was the contender to the post of AG was more than 62 years old. As per the constitutional provision, if you are somebody who can be appointed as a judge, then you are considered for the appointment as an advocate general to put it in a nutshell. Now, this gentleman was already he would crossed 62. So, the contention of the petitioner was that you since you are more than 62, you cannot be appointed as an high court judge and therefore, you cannot be content and therefore, you cannot be appointed as the advocate general. Now, the one big mistake that the petitioner did made was he did not look up the law. There were as many as 9 judgments of the Supreme Court on this very issue because these were the contentions raised by various petitioners in various, uh, for, um, uh, in various states for challenging the appointment of advocate general or similar constitutional authorities. Nine judgments which said that even post 62, a person can be appointed as the advocate general. The court came down very heavily on the petitioner, essentially because he was a lawyer who ought to have known better, who ought to have looked up the law before filing the PIL. The cost of a lack of rupees was given against him. I would like to read out to you all just two paragraphs, just one paragraph, paragraph 143, which is at page 453. There is after the court narrated the history of PIL and locus standi, from paragraphs 143 about 20 paragraphs have been devoted to the abuse of public interest litigation. The first of the paragraph which pithily puts in a nutshell what the abuse is, is as follows. Unfortunately of late, it has been noticed that such an important jurisdiction which is the PIL jurisdiction which has been carefully carved out created, nurtured with great care and caution by the court is blatantly being abused by filing some petition with oblique motives. We, we think that the time has come when genuine and bona fide public interest litigation must be encouraged, where frivolous public interest litigation should be discouraged. In our considered opinion, we have to protect and preserve this important jurisdiction in the larger interest of people in of this country but we must take effective steps to prevent and cure its abuse on the basis of monetary and non-monetary di directions by the court. Then the court went on in paragraph 181 to
to give the guidelines, to issue the guidelines on the basis of which the PIL rules were formed. So now with this backdrop, let us now try to actually frame a PIL. Let us consider a case where a client comes to you and says there is huge amount of overcrowding in the BEST buses. The women find it impossible to get in. They are either left out. When they do get in, there is a chance that they face some kind of molestation. There is a chance that they are very, very uncomfortable. There is a chance that they are going to have a very difficult journey. The seats in the front which are reserved for women are already filled by the women in the earlier from the uh, who get in from the earlier stops. So there is a petition that we need to file where the reliefs are that women commuters should be allowed to enter from the front entrance. This is the broad proposition. Now let us go ahead and try and file uh, try and draft a PIL. The whole Today's lecture is how to draft a PIL, how to file a PIL. So now, with this proposition, who do you think, suggest some petitioner. Who do you think can be a petitioner? Okay. Now, does it necessarily have to be somebody who is affected? All right. So, it can be an individual. It may not be a person who actually commutes. Can it be a letter written to the uh, Chief Justice? Yes. Right. Suppose one of the High Court judge is going home in his car in the evening and in the traffic his car is waiting behind so many other vehicles and out of his window he can see that there is a huge crowd at the bus stop. Some woman gets dragged behind as she is trying to get into the um, uh, bus and the bus goes off. There are so many other women who stay back. Can he do something about it? Yes. What would he be able to do? Sure. Sure. All right. What else? So motor generally would be if you have the assignment of writ jurisdiction or if you are the chief justice. Suppose this is a judge who has n who doesn't fall in either of this category. He is taking labor matters. What can he do? He writes a letter to the chief justice, and that can be used as the basis to form, file the uh, uh, PL to commence the PL. So now we have identified the petitioner. What is your job as an advocate before filing the petition? You've you've already identified the petitioner. It could be either of them. Right. Firstly, look up your case law. Do not make the mistake that was made in Balwan Singh Chauffal's case, because by now the courts are agitated enough to make you, the lawyer, pay the cost out of your pocket, not your client. That also stage will come. So, as the as the lawyer, you be very very careful. Research your case law. Thoroughly, thoroughly well. Okay, go on. But when you go on uh, Madhupatra or SEC, like sometimes when you type, so many times you don't find PIL judgments there. Like, you know, they may have come, but you don't see them there. So, how do you do the research? How many years of practice have you had, sir? I haven't had. You are not a lawyer? I have studied law, but I have not had. Okay. So, there is a high court library. There are libraries in the government law college or elsewhere. Before the Manupatra, before SSC online, before all these online websites came about, we used to go pick up the basic book, which in this case would be constitution or something analogous like the BST law. We would look up the commentary, we would try and find the judgment which was same or similar. We would then take up, take out the citation, ask the library peons to give you the book concerned. We would look up the case law and then we would be ready. So there are ways and ways of doing it. In fact, if you do only the web search, very often we are going to miss the forest for the trees. You are not going to be able to find 
very relevant judgment. So this is something, this is an aside. As advocates, do not base your research only on the material which is online. Because that is a very blinkered way of doing research. You are going to type the magic words BST, um, right to entrance or something like that. It is not going to give you the desired results because if those search words are missing in the judgment, you are not going to find the judgment. In fact, there are wonderful digests that we have. There are Supreme Court digests, there are BCR digests, there are MLJ digests, there are, there are all MR digests. Go to each one of them and look up. It is going to be a little bit more lengthy process, but it is well worth it because that is the way you read up a lot more and you become a much uh, better grounded lawyer instead of just somebody who is doing a very blinkered research. So you do the research. Now you have your research ready. You are ready to take the ne next step forward. You are ready to now start drafting the petition. What is it that you are going to do now? Wonderful yeah. point. I am glad you raised it. Very good. That is a very, very intelligent uh, point that you have made. Do not jump to litigation because the courts are going to ask you exactly what the gentleman just suggested. That if you have not, you have to give opportunity to the authority to make amends or to do what you think is the right or the required thing to do. So yes, you give notice. What else? Now you have given notice. The client has come to you. Now you have to draft the petition. What is it that would you, you, you all would do? I will tell you in my experience what is the best way of drafting. Let me take you back to about 30 years ago when I was day one, I was a law student in my third year law. We had three year course then and it was my second day at one of the big firms where I was interning. And I was given a brief at 5.15 in the evening and said go and brief senior counsel Mahendra Shah. And Risha is one of, was one of the leading senior counsels of the Bombay High Court, a very, very, very revered gentleman. So I was feeling very important that I have to go and brief senior counsel Mahendra Shah. The brief was tied and of course I did not even untie the string to see what the matter was. Because I, it was second day of work, I said I have to go and brief him. So I went in, the gentleman was bent in his chambers doing something. So without looking up he said yes. So I said sir I have come to brief you. Okay tell me what the matter is about. And there I came back down to earth because that is when I realized that briefing does not mean that I have to be the pune who goes and delivers the brief. Briefing means I have to tell the counsel what the matter is all about. So I had the presence of mind to untie the brief. But then I was lost because I did not know what to do next. So I was turning the pages and he says, read the prayer clause. So I read the prayer clause and Eureka, I knew what the matter was all about. So anytime you want to draft any petition, any plaint, anything, first draft your prayer clause, always. Put the cart before the horse. First draft the, uh, the prayer. So now in this case, what is the prayer that we are going to draft? In our case where we want women to enter, be allowed to enter from the front, door, front entrance. They want, we want them to board the bus from the front entrance. What is the prayer that we are going to ask? A little bit more specific. A little better. We will come to that in a minute. We will come to that in a minute. Let us get our prayer clause right. We will ask for a mandamus or a writ direction or order in the nature of mandamus directing the respondents to permit uh, to frame appropriate rules or come out with appropriate notification 
whereby women commuters are allowed to enter from the to board the bus from the front entrance of the bus. So, this would be the in a nutshell what our prayer would be. Would there be any interim relief that we can ask in this kind of a petition? Any interim relief you all can think of? Mm. No court will grant you that. A lot of the times in practice we have that kind of interim reliefs which are being asked, where interim reliefs are the same as the final relief. <laughs> but no, no court will grant you because the minute you ask uh, that kind of an interim relief is given, the co no, no court is then going to, your petition is almost worked out, right? So, such an interim relief will not be entertained. So, no, in this case, in this particular case that we are discussing, there will be no interim reliefs that we can ask for. All right. So, this is the prayer. Now, let us go back. The title will be High Court of Judicature, OCJ, PIL, number blank of so and so. Petitioner will be an individual, it can be an organizer or organization which is into say uh, commuters rights. Right? So, it can be individual, it can be organization, it can be a letter, we will come to the letter in a minute because there it will have to be slightly different. All right. So, we have the petitioners ready. Who are going to be the respondents? The state government? In BST, who will be the person concerned? Right. So, you will have state as a pro forma party because BST is a BMC or uh, autonomous body. It is a B autonomous body of the BMC. So, you will have to have the BMC and you will have to have the general manager of the uh, BST who are going to be parties. Now, next, after most respectfully, Shwet, all of those or before that you will have to mention under what provision of law you are filing this petition. So, this particular petition that we are considering, which are, which are the constitutional or the statutory provisions that we are looking at? Why 21? Right to live with dignity, all right. Anything else? How about 14? Because we are making a reasonable classification, we are seeking a reasonable classification to be made for women. So, therefore, 14 and 21. Invariably, all your PILs can some which way come under 14 or 21, apart from other fundamental rights or other statutory rights. We have finished the title, now we come to the body of the petition. Now, under the rules, the PIL rules of 2010, which have, which have been framed by the High Court, we need to give complete details of the petitioner. So, let us presume it is Mr. XYZ or Ms. ABC or Mrs. ABC who is the petitioner. You have to give his or her name, complete address, email, phone number, occupation, Aadhaar card, PAN card and what is the income that the person has. PIL rules have become very, very stringent post Balwan Singh Chauffal. So, all of these details are required to be mentioned. After that, now you come to the crux of the matter. Now, what are you going to write in terms of the actual uh, issue that you are agitating? Yes, that of course you will. Now, let us come to the meat of the matter. What will you mention in the petition? Why are you filing the petition? Hardships. Hardship? Specific kind of hardship that the women face in the daily commute. Very well. And therefore, the need for the... Okay. So, merely writing that women commuters face hardship, is it going to be sufficient for the court to take cognizance of this? So, what else will you write to beef up yeah, your petition? How the entry from the rear exit, rear exit door causes the kind of discomfort 
Now, on what basis are you going to say that? There will have to be some incidents which will have to be explicitly reported, including taking cognizance of the interviews that may have been taken by the petitioner or similar uh, organizations of people of such women who commute every day and therefore their narratives of the hardships or the discomforts or the kinds of molestations issues that they may have faced. Good point, incidents. except that if you are going to talk to say 25 women commuters and you are going to record their statement, why will the court believe that? So some incident in the case, case law is one thing. You will have to, right, now you will have to gather data. Suppose there have been incidents where women have been molested or suppose there have been incidents where women commuters have been hurt while trying to climb the bus. Those would all be police complaints which are there you'll have to find the data. So, data becomes very, very important. Data is very important and this has to be data. See, when it comes to pure, uh, PIL, there has to be a purity of purpose and you'll have to be very exact with the kind of material you're laying before the court. I will come back to this point in just a minute. Let me ask you, this is the point I'm making to drive home what kind of data is required. What is the difference between a civil litigation, say a plaint and a PIL writ petition in terms of the, in terms of what goes in the petition <coughs> or the plaint, what you mention in the plaint and what you mention in the petition, what is the difference between the two, a civil suit and a PIL writ petition? It's a private thing. All right. What is? In consideration of the whole society, you be a representative. Yeah. I am. Now let us narrow that down. The broad distinction is absolutely correct. But what is the? What is it that goes in in a petition, and what is it that goes into a plaint? In terms of the body, the, we forget the title now. In terms of the body, in terms of the meat of the matter that is mentioned in the plaint and that is mentioned in the petition. Think in terms of what is mentioned in the plaint. What do you mention in the plaint? Facts. Facts. Absolutely correct. In a plaint, in a civil suit, you are required only to mention the facts. You are not required to give evidence. The evidence is something that will come at a much later stage when you have to prove the facts that are mentioned in the plaint or in the written statement. So, a civil suit will have only facts. As compared to that, in a petition, in a writ petition, in a PIL, there is no stage of evidence in a regular normal course. You have to come with your facts and evidence all rolled in one, in one petition. So therefore, whatever it is that you are mentioning in your petition has to be well researched because that is what is going to ultimately get you success or your petition fails. Let me take you to two judgments on this aspect. What is the evidence that the court looks at? In the Shabarimala judgment, Justice Rowenton Nariman at uh, paragraph, I think it is 199, has said that writ petition is not merely pleading, but it is also evidence. Let me read out this to you. This is something I think it is going to be the basis of any successful petition. A fervent plea was made by some of the counsels for the respondent that the court should not decide this case without any evidence being led on both sides. But Justice Nariman held, evidence is very much there in the form of the writ petition and in the form of affidavits that have been filed in the writ petition both by the petitioners 
as well as by the board and the Tantri's affidavit referred to Supra. It must not be forgotten that a writ petition filed either under 32 or 226 is itself not merely a pleading but also evidence in form of affidavits that are sworn. So, a PIL, a writ petition, what you mention in the body of the petition will be your evidence. In some cases where additional affidavits come in as the case unfolds, that affidavit also will become evidence. So, this is the difference between a regular pleading in a civil suit, in a CPC proceeding and in a PIL. The other judgment which is again very important where this aspect of evidence has been put, for, put forth very pithily is the case of Bharat Singh and others. It is 1988 for SSC 534. Uh, let us go to paragraph, I think the relevant paragraph is paragraph 13 at page 543. In our opinion, when a point is, which is ostensibly a point of law required to be substantiated by fact, the party raising the point, if he is a writ petitioner, must plead and prove such facts by evidence which must appear in the form of, appear from the writ petition and if he is the respondent from the counter affidavit. And further details regarding the evidence has been given in the relevant paragraph. So, these are the two judgments, I am sure there are many other judgments which set out that as, com as against a plaint where only facts need to be pleaded, in petition, your writ petition, your PIL petition becomes evidence in itself and therefore, what you mention in the petition is of great, great importance. Do your homework well before you file the petition, get the data, get the report get the statistics, put it in. So, now coming back to women commuters right to board from the front gate, go to the police stations, find out or go to the police website, find, find out how many incidents of molestation are there, how many accidents have happened, find out what is, there might be bodies commu who look after the commuters woes and they do studies, find out those studies, put those studies in. There are several public transport systems in other states of India where there already is such a facility available for women commuters where they enter from the front door, from the front entrance if the seats for women are reserved in the front or the entrance from the uh, or they enter from the back entrance if the seats reserved for women are at the back. Kerala for example is one such state where there is a separate entrance for men commuter and separate entrance for women commu commuters. So, do that kind of homework, find out which other states already has this kind of a facility available for women and put that into your petition to buttress your case. So, evidence, your facts and your evidence has to be very well put in in the petition. So, now you have put in your facts. Make out your grounds now. What would be your grounds for the petition? Yeah. Elaborate a little more. Right. Correct. Correct. Then, whatever is going to be your argument in a nutshell has to be put in into the grounds without elaborating. The grounds should be one one sentence at the highest two sentences. Do not make a thesis, do not make it run into a page, do not make it run into a huge paragraph. Put it very pithily. Then you have the few mandatory clauses that you put in any writ petition that you have not filed any other similar petition, that you have paid the court fees, etcetera, etcetera. 
the PIL rules are very very stringent when it comes to costs. For any petition which is not bona fide, which is not filed bona fide with the court thinks is not a PIL, but is it, a, it is a publicity interest litigation or a political interest litigation or a litigation which is filed for any oblique motive, the court is going to come down heavily and award costs against you. The rule 7a and rule 11 talks of security for costs. So, you may be in the middle of the petition required by the court to file uh, to deposit monies, you may be asked to make affidavits showing your bank balance etcetera. So, be very conscious of what kind of costs may be awarded against you. The rules also provide for appointment of amicus curiae. We have the petition which is filed in a given case you will be the advocate, but suppose it is a letter written by a woman commuter who fell down and hurt herself when because she could not get into the bus. She writes a letter to the chief justice with the chief justice converts into a PIL. Now, the court has only the bare sketchy details, the court does not have details at all. Court will not go out to file to find the details for itself. The court will appoint an amicus curiae who is going to help the court with all possible statistics, looking up the case law, submitting making submissions before the court as to in which way the matter can take forward. So, the statistics or the reports that you as an advocate filed um, uh, gathered before you filed the petition is something which an amicus curiae would be able to do. Your petition is filed, it is ready. Um, one of you all had raised the issue of what if it is not public interest litigation, who had asked that? Maintainability. Maintainability. Yeah, yeah. Well, what was your uh, query ma'am? In the prayer you do not need to say that, your maintainability you have to prove by drafting it appropriately as per the PIL rules of 2010. It is for the respondents to contend that it is not maintainable. Mind you if a PIL is not maintainable and the court comes to the conclusion that it was filed for motives other than anything genuine the courts have started awarding heavy costs. In a recent case which went from Karnataka I think to the Supreme Court, the courts awarded 25 lakhs as costs against the petitioner. Now, this was a case, this is uh, Sri Abraham TJ versus state of Karnataka. The citation is 2018 12 SCC 515. There were two women who owned a plot of land which they gifted to the state government in this case. The gift was for a specific purpose that you use the land for making the taluka office, a mini Vidhan Sauda. The Vidhan Sabha in Karnataka is called Vidhan Sauda. So, the, the gift was to make a mini Vidhan Sauda in the district in which the land was situated. The government accepted the gift, but instead of making the gift, uh, instead of creating the taluka office in that particular plot, they made it slightly away because that was a plot which would have been more convenient. So, this gentleman Sri Abraham filed a PIL alleging that this was misuse of the gifted land. The court came down very heavily on him. The court said that you had no business filing this writ petition. In any event, a taluka office has been established. 
the repetition, the PIL was dismissed and 25 lakhs were awarded against him. So as an advocate, be very, very careful because you owe it to your clients not to have, not to be saddled with this kind of cause. But it wasn't the ladies who, were, who had filed, the ladies gifted the land, they were okay with it. It was a third party who had got nothing to do with either the land or the taluka office who filed a writ petition and therefore the court awarded 25 lakhs against him. Perhaps, perhaps not. The, see, what if I will tell you, if suppose the gift was, land was gifted to them, the land was, gift, uh, land was uh, to be used for making taluka office. Suppose instead of that, a, the chief minister's private residential bungalow was constructed on that plot. Then it was a clear misuse of the gift and therefore the state government could have been sued in this case because it was the chief minister who is heading the state who misused it. And if it was filed by the women themselves, by the two women who gifted the plot, if they had done it, then it would have been slightly different. So, and in this case though they were, they had, it was their land, they could have the PIL filed by them, if it had been filed by them, in a situation where it was used for some other purpose which was completely uh, contrary to the provision, to the gift deed. In that case, they could have maintained a PIL because they had gifted it for making a taluka office. So, instead of using it for public benefit, if it was used for some private benefit, then the PIL could have been filed and it would have been maintainable also. So, to sum up, it has to be remembered that PIL is a very, very important weapon in the hands of the citizens, the petitioners and you as the advocates. Ensure that the purity of purpose is always maintained. PIL is not a publicity interest litigation. The minute you fall foul of that, you may be awarded a cost of 25 lakhs or worse. And it is it takes not just the petitioner, a PIL to become successful requires a fearless and courageous judge. It requires a fearless and courageous advocate and it requires a fearless and courageous petitioner. When all of this have comes together and when you can make out that there is a public wrong which is being committed, there is a right which vests in the public which is not being given to them, there is some step which is being taken by the authority which denies the rights available to, a, to the public which are being taken away. It is in that situation that you can file a PIL. But be very, very clear about the motive for which you are filing the PIL. Thank you. Those were the scintillating words from our guest, Advocate Manjari Shah. I believe that uh, many PIL warriors will come up from today's lecture and from our audience also because this will be streamed on YouTube and social media. And uh, I believe that this would be a longer session or a symposium. We would have definitely come up with some PIL to be presented before the court. I would request our founder, Advocate Rahul Muskar, to give a memento as a memory from our session. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, we have a tradition where we ask our guests to give feedback. I think the feedback should be coming from you all, <laughs> not from me. They, they will give on their replies. Yes, this is from your side as to how the Hammurabi is doing and whether it is in that sense. So, till the time man is writing, uh, we have uh, same program on the next month in February also. 
but right now i am not able to announce the guest because you know there are the guest is still confirming the date so i am not announcing it but of course since we have given your numbers everything will come on your whatsapp as well as facebook so please do come and support us in this manner plus if there are students here again might be for repetition if somebody are here but we also run a program called i enhance student so if anybody among you who is a student who intends to come to that program may please contact us and we will be happy to call in as our guest along with that on every fourth saturday of the month we have a program called i enhance advocate in that an advocate who is 5 years and below it's very very clear 5 years and below only not above that 5 years and below we call him as our guest and he delivers lecture this is done in uh, mallard ses plaza so accordingly on next saturday we have a uh, advocate called tanmay jadav tanmay jadav who will be delivering a lecture on what if police doesn't take your case suppose you go to police station and police doesn't register your case so what if police doesn't take your case do you have a remedy if so how how you have to go ahead what you should do so that's a lecture for that and thank you with mahaburavi for a lot of time please do subscribe for our channel because you know this spreads our channel to a lot of people once again thank you thank you for it vinayak jay hai bharat bhagya vidhata पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्रावण उत्थल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्छल जल दितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाए तव जय गाथा जन गन मन गन दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता